the 1920s in Norfolk. With the release of the 1921 census online in January this year, 2022, we are thinking today about what makes this census so special and what was going on locally and further afield in the 1920s. A census has been taken every 10 years from 1801 with detailed information about individuals recorded from 1841. These details are then closed for 100 years. This is why it is so exciting for family historians and local history buffs when a census is released. The 1921 census is even more special as it will be the last one for some time. The schedules of the 1931 census were destroyed in a fire and the 1941 census were never taken due to the Second World War. So the next time we will see the release of a census, it will be 2052. The 1921 census itself ran into difficulties. It was originally scheduled to take place on the 24th of April 1921, but due to industrial action and a fear of a general strike, the census was postponed to the 19th of June 1921. The one and only time a census was delayed. We can see from this leaflet that the schedules had already been printed and these were used without alteration. By the time of the 1921 census, the country was recovering from the First World War, where over a million people from Great Britain had died. And also the global Spanish flu pandemic from 1918 to 1920, which claimed over 220,000 lives in Great Britain. As we have seen, the decade brought worker unrest. There was industrial action by railwaymen, coal miners and transport workers, which caused the census to be postponed in 1921. There was also the farm workers strike of 1923. This image is from Walsingham and the general strike of 1926. Many people used scribbles and sketches when filling in the census returns to show their dissatisfaction with the government. It's worth remembering that war widows had to wait until 1925 for a 10 shilling pension and additional allowances for children. This sketch is found on a 1921 census return for London. Three men in top hats are sitting at a table while a woman serves tea. It is captioned, counting available cannon fodder, next war 1936 from census returns 1921. The 1921 census also includes the usual information about occupation or profession, but also has the additional information of the address of the employer. So you'll get extra information to find out if your ancestor worked for the local business Coleman's or Cayley's, which is the picture here, Bolton and Paul, or perhaps Gerald's. At the time of the 1921 census, many soldiers were still stationed overseas. This table shows a portion of the peace codes for British forces overseas at the time of the 1921 census. You can see how many deployments there were in Ireland. This was the point at which the Irish Free State was established following the three years of the Irish War of Independence. A treaty was signed in 1921. In December 1922, most of Ireland became a self-governing Irish Free State, free from British rule whilst a group of the northernmost counties remained part of the United Kingdom. It wasn't until 1949 that Ireland finally became a republic and left the British Commonwealth completely, ending 700 years of British colonial rule. The 1921 census features the first female policewoman, as well as significantly more female barristers, medical professionals, architects than recorded a decade earlier, for the first time since, 1801, since the 1801 census, women outnumbered men, most notably in the 20 to 45 age group, with 1.7 million more women than men, with the greatest difference being in urban areas. This led to this charming article from the Times dated the 30th of August 1921, where the excess of women, women of a marriageable age in the population could be solved if women considered moving abroad to the Dominions, this included Australia and New Zealand, to procure themselves a husband. Women in the 1920s were more independent than ever before. 
the suffragettes finally secured women's voting rights in 1918, though full equality in voting had to wait until 1928 with the Representation of the People Act. Norwich had three female council members in 1920 and in 1923 Dorothy Dewson was elected as the Labour MP for Norwich, becoming the city's first female MP. She was defeated the following year, however. She also served on the Norwich City Council from 1929 to 1936. Her maiden speech as an MP was on the subject of extending voting rights to younger women. She tried to get support for family allowances and easier access to birth control. In 1923, Ethel Coleman became the first Lady Lord Mayor of Norwich. She's the daughter of Jeremiah Coleman of Mustard fame. Her Lady Mayoress was her younger sister, Helen. She was also one of the first women deacons at the Princess Street Congregational Church and one of the very first female deacons at any congregational church. There were many medical discoveries in the 1920s. These include the discovery of insulin in 1921, um, which was used to treat a human for diabetes on the 11th of January 1922. In 1928, the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming. Elmer McCollum discovered vitamin D and its presence in cod liver. This was used to prevent rickets. The discovery of vitamins A, B, C and K, this was in the 1920s too. The tuberculosis vaccine was developed and also diphtheria and tetanus anatoxins were developed. Throughout the 1920s, Marie Stokes fought for better birth control options for women, opening clinics in the East End of London for working class women and encouraging the formation of 66 birth control organisations, which became the basis of the Family Planning Association in 1930. These images you can see are taken from the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital for Nurses Register for the 1920s. The 1918 Education Act made primary school free for all children and meant that they were staying in school for longer. Most children still left school at age 14 though. This is an image of a baking class in Dursingham in the 1920s. This 1923 image shows those in the big room according to the caption. This is from the school exercise books of Ivy Pastel of Tunstead School. When we think of the 1920s, we might think of one of the greatest archaeological discoveries that occurred in November 1922, when British archaeologist Howard Carter, who was brought up in Norfolk, and his team unearthed, after more than 3,000 years, the burial chamber of King Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Excavating the tomb over a number of years, thousands of priceless and incredible objects were retrieved, including the most amazing of all, the perfectly preserved mummy of Tutankhamun himself. In October 1924 in Swaffham, you could see an illustrated talk by Howard Carter on his discovery. When we think of the 1920s, we may also think of the flappers and the Charleston. But what was the modern woman wearing in Norfolk? Here are a few suggestions from the pages of the Dis Express spread throughout the de decade. We have um, January 1920 on the left hand side, April 1921, August 1925 and June 1928. As we can see, hems and hair get shorter as the decade progresses. To go with those fabulous frocks, how about a pair of these shoes from the Shorten and Arms? These are shoe designs by Leo Dack from the 1920s. The business was started in 1918 by Harry Shorten, a pattern maker, and George Arms, a shoemaker, along with George Barrett, a solicitor's clerk. At first, children's shoes were made, but increasingly, from about 1920, they specialised in women's light fashion shoes. Production started in St John's Madder Market in Norwich. In 1919, the business moved to St Stephen's on Church Lane in Norwich.
Here are a few books that were published in the 1920s that you may be familiar with. In 1921, Agatha Christie's first book, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, was published. It began the adventures of Hercule Poirot, and in the 1930s, Christie was to spend some time in the shrubs in North Walsham in Norfolk. It's now the Beechwood Hotel. Um, she's, this was with the McCloyds, who were doctors she'd met during her travels in Mesopotamia. In 1925, Virginia Woolf published Mrs Dalloway. At the beginning of the century, Virginia Woolf had stayed in Blow Norton. Um, in 1924, Emma Louise Turner, a leading ornithologist, published her first collection of articles and photographs called Broadland Birds. Other books published that year, with no Norfolk connections, however. Um, in 1924, E.M. Forster published Passage to India. In 1925, F. Scott Fitzgerald published The Great Gatsby. In 1926, A.A. Milne published Winnie the Pooh and in 28, The House at Pooh Corner. And in, also in 1928, Lady Chatterley's Lover was first published privately in Italy. The Mudder Market Theatre in Norwich was formed in 1921 by its founder, Nugent Monk. When it was opened, it was said to be the first building in England since the Commonwealth definitely constructed with an apron stage and gallery so that Shakespeare can be given upon the stage for which he wrote. This beautiful set design from 1927 from the records of the Madder Market Theatre was created by Andrew Stevenson for a production of Shakespeare's comedy of mistaken identities, Much Ado About Nothing. These papers belonged to Monk before deposit at the Norfolk Record Office and include scripts, prompts, programmes, personal papers and papers from the Norwich Players and the Madder Market Theatre, and also settings and black back cloth designs, providing a rich resource for those interested in the history of the stage. The decade also saw the birth of the BBC, with 100 year anniversary of broadcasting celebrated this year. On the 14th of November 1922, the British Broadcasting Company started its first daily radio news service in London at 6pm. We can see from this extract there was a big push for radio broadcasting in 1926. And in 1929, you could buy and then build a Mullard Master 3 receiver for £8, 6 shillings and 11 pence, or 12 monthly payments of 15 shillings. This was the equivalent to about £400 today, and in 1929 would have been 25 days wages of a skilled tradesperson, so an expensive bit of kit. The picture shows Brahms Wireless Shop in, in Dis. The 1920s saw the growth of filmmaking and film going. Here we have a plan for a cinema and ballroom in King's Lynn. People could go to see Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd, or perhaps Nosferatu in 1922, or Metropolis in 1927. The talkies were developed mid-decade with the jazz singer appearing in 1927. In the early 1920s, there were approximately 350,000 private cars in the UK, but by the end of the decade, this was more than a million. If you were poorer, you may go on a Sharabank day trip to perhaps to the seaside. A popular holiday destination for the middle classes was the Norfolk Broads. This um, is a document of a journal of summer trips on the Norfolk Broads from 1924 to 1928, when the author was between 11 and 15 years old. The journal includes some photographs, drawings and paintings. There are also um, incidents straight out of Arthur Ransom's Coot Club, for example, a large motor launch called the Enchantress. Ransom would have called them hullabaloos, nearly capsized the child's dinghy by running into it. They visit many places along the rivers and broads of Norfolk, including Acle, Barton Broad, um, Coltishall, Ludham and Wroxham. They also have trips by bus, train or car further afield. 
For example, in 1924, there's a bus trip to Lowestoft with ice cream and a Punch and Judy show on the beach, or a trip by train to Norwich visiting Gerald's to buy books and enjoying the cathedral. We learn about the daily routines of bathing, eating, rowing, sailing and provisioning the boat. Also, what books they're reading. And there's the traditional pastime of how many mosquitoes can be caught before bedtime. While the journal is charming in itself, it also offers information as to how the Broads economy worked in the 1920s. People who could rent boats or you could own a boat and have it overwintered and sail to the starting point of your holiday. You could pay someone to skipper your boat or you could have someone provision the boat or, or move it while you had an outing. You could have your laundry done en route and you could provision your boat, boat from shops in the villages or farms. Uh, there was even a market boat. You could even arrange to have milk delivered to the boat or arrange to collect a pie or a cooked chicken or duck as you went along. Those who were even more wealthy could visit the battlefields of Europe, as Judith Ferrier did in 1920. This extract is from Wednesday, May the 19th and 20th. We got up early, that is to say, the party which was going to do the Cook's tour, Arras, Lenz and Vimy Ridge. We left the house at 7.45am and caught the train at the Garden Oar at 830 where we were met by the cook's guide and the rest of the party, which consisted of five English and three French people. In leaving the town, we crawled, stopping every few minutes through very deserted country, which had once been woods, but which is now bare ground full of shell holes, with every now and then a few trunks of trees stripped of bark and branches, quite black as if struck by lightning, and here and there one or two ruined cottages and lots and lots of barbed wire. Following the First World War, the 1919 Housing Act, known as the Addison Act, promised homes for heroes. The first council house built in Norwich was on Angel Road in October 1920, with Mile Cross being the first major housing estate built by Norwich City Council, with Stanley Ashhead, Professor of Civic Divine at the University of Liverpool, employed to create the plan. The aim, a hundred years ago, was to provide high quality council housing. The image is a, of a plan of a proposed houses on the Earlham Estate for Norwich Housing Development Company. This particular plan shows the 1924 house designs for the corner of George Burrow Drive and Kennet Close. This is from the records of H.C. Boardman Architects. Between 1919 and 1930, the corporation built 3,324 houses and used to pull the land the corporation had bought for housing except for part of the Earlham estate. In 1919, Small one bedroom flats were let out for five shillings and a penny inclusive, whilst three bedroom non parlour houses were let for five shillings and with seven pence electricity charge and six pence for hot water. It was estimated this would lead to the rehousing of over 8,000 people. As we have seen following the First World War, there was unemployment and hardship. With money from the Unemployment Grants Committee, the Norwich Corporation created parks partly to provide unemployment relief. For example, in the Mile Cross Gardens, the pavilions were constructed in concrete to provide as much employment as possible. The National Playing Fields Association at the time recommended local authorities adopt a minimum of five acres of open space per hundred people. This should include space for team games, tennis bowls and playgrounds. Captain Arnold Sandy Winch was um, Norwich City Council's park superintendent from 1919 to 1956. And he was the key figure in designing five key Norwich parks, Eton, Wensum, Waterloo, Higham and Mile Cross Gardens. Sandy Winch was also responsible for the allotment provision in Norwich too. 1921 saw the work beginning on Hayne Park and it opened in 1924. In 1927, Woodrow Pilling Park opened. In 28, Eaton Park opened, was opened by Prince, the Prince of Wales. Um, it took three and a half years with more than 100 men 
um, employed to build it. 29 saw, 1929 saw Slow Bottom and Mile Cross Gardens open. In Great Yarmouth, the Venetian Waterways and Boating Lake was also built under the same scheme. Nine schemes were proposed to the committee in 1924 and the waterways was the successful plan. Priority for work was given to unemployed married men with at least one child. It was completed in 1928 and 427 men had been employed on the gardens. Restoration work began in June 2018 on, on the waterways and this took place over a year and was supported very successfully by volunteers. The project was funded by through a £1.77 million national lot, lottery grant um, and um, further support was through the Borough Council too. Some close-ups here of the, um, the plans for the waterways. We can see islands and the boating areas and the paths and the planting designs. It's got some photographs here of people enjoying the waterways when it opened. We can see the large boats crammed with people seem stormy skies behind um, the islands and pavilions and another view of the boating areas. The current Whitefriars Bridge in Norwich was opened in 1925 and was built by the city engineers A.E. Collins. another view of the bridge being built. The current Carrow Bridge was also designed by A.E. Collins who is a city engineer. Um, it was built by J. Butlers of Leeds. It's a single leaf roller bascule lifting bridge and it was opened by the Prince of Wales in June 1923 and cost £42,000 at the time. Um, both Coleman's and Bolton and Paul contributed towards the cost. In every town, village and workplace across the country, war memorials were built. Money was raised, designs approved, memorials built and then unveiled. Here we've got Durham being unveil unveiled in 1922 by Prince Henry. We've got Aylsham in the middle and Methwold on the right hand side. The War Memorial in Norwich was designed by Lutyens and was set up in front of the Guildhall in 1927 and moved to the present site opposite City Hall in 1928. Throughout the 1920s, the impact of war continued to cast a long shadow. So perhaps Norfolk was not roaring, but it was a time of recovery and reconstruction. <laughs>